So far in this series, we've seen a number of scenarios that pose a number of problems for professional engineers. These are very realistic scenarios. These are problems that engineers occur, uh, encounter in their everyday professional work. How can we think through these problems, uh, especially when they have an ethical component? How can we make good decisions? Well, I like to approach moral problems in the same uh, way that we approach technical problems, using the same problem-solving skills. We first analyze the situation. So for a moral problem, we want to identify the um, addition, uh, affected parties. Who is affected here? It may be the uh, users of a product. It may be other people uh, who are uh, in the vicinity. And the affected parties here uh, may not be the people uh, you initially think of. But there may be a lot more people affected than you may think. So it's important to think broadly about who's affected. What are the rights and responsibilities? Uh, and also whether you need additional information. Uh, sometimes to make a wise decision, you need additional information, which requires really the ability to see what's not there without hallucinating. So that's an analytical step. A second step would be a synthetic or design step. What are the alternative actions? Um, and engineers are very good at being creative and thinking of alternatives. Finally, an evaluation step. Imagine possible consequences and evaluate those consequences or alternatives. Uh, are they good consequences? Are there more good consequences than bad consequences? And so on. Um, so this should be very familiar to all of you who've been solving problems for many years. Analysis, synthesis, evaluation. It's not an automatic procedure, however. You can't plug numbers into a formula and come up with the right answer. So let me talk a little bit more about the evaluation step, how we evaluate uh, actions and consequences according to moral criteria. So we can use some basic ethical values. We can say that this action demonstrates honesty, fairness, civility, respect for others, kindness, so on. Basic values that all of us uh, share. Or we can use the following uh, handy tests. Uh, a harms test. Do the benefits outweigh the harms, both short term and long term? This is your basic cost benefit test. And it's important to consider both the short term and long term harms. If I throw out, throw out anomalous data, I can make my results graph look good and finish the lab report right now. But then what happens to my long term reputation for integrity? Can people trust me? If I if they know that I just throw out data that uh, don't make my uh, that data that make my graphs look ugly, so that could be a long term damage to my reputation. Reversibility test: Would I still think this choice is a good one if I traded places? It's very useful to imagine the perspectives of other people. That is to trade places. In the lab report example, if you are reading my lab report and you know I falsified the data, can you trust the report? Can you trust me? So. Um, this is looking at it from the viewpoint of somebody else. When he was president, Dwight Eisenhower used to act, ask, how does this look to the other guy? Um, in the case of the uh, trade secrets that we talked about earlier, uh, the, uh, we applied the reversibility test when we uh, said that uh, you could tell your vice president you would not want me to uh, divulge your trade secrets and so, therefore, you shouldn't ask me to divulge the trade secrets of my former employer. That's an application of the reversibility test. The common practice test. What if everybody behaved this way? What if everybody in a similar situation chose the same action? What if everybody falsified laboratory data? Then no one would be able to trust any laboratory results. If you study formal, philo formal philosophical ethics, this is basically Kant's categorical imperative or a universalizability test. Some more moral tests. A legality test. Would this choice violate a law or a policy of my employer? Uh, it's important that we honor the law, but there's a big difference between what's legal and what's moral. Let's suppose you're driving on a busy highway in a big city, such as the Dan Ryan Expressway near Chicago. If you drive safely with the flow of traffic, you are exceeding the speed limit and breaking the law. On the other hand, if you drive at the speed limit, other motorists will try to pass you and you are endangering them. So what's legal and what's moral may not be exactly the same. In addition, laws cannot cover every possible activity, and laws don't determine what is right and wrong. Uh, when the Enron executives claimed that, what they, that claimed that they had done nothing wrong, what they meant was that they did nothing illegal, that what they did was allowed by law. Even if what they did was allowed by law, their actions were clearly deceptive, clearly fraudulent. 
So they were, on the face of it, absolutely wrong. Finally, the law generally tells us what we should not do, but ethics is really about what we should do. Another test is the colleague test. What would professional colleagues say? Is my behavior up to the standards of the profession? One way of determining whether my behavior is up to the standards of the profession is by examining codes of ethics. So that the codes of ethics represent a con professional consensus on what it means for uh, a professional, how a professional should act. A very useful test is the wise relative test. What would my wise old uncle or aunt do? What would some of your wise professors do in this situation? Students generally find this a very useful test. Um, a mirror test. Would I feel proud of myself when I look into the mirror afterwards? How would I feel um, if I looked into myself? Finally, we have the publicity test. How would this choice look on the front page of a newspaper such as, uh, say, the student newspaper? Everything I know is from reading the student newspaper. Probably that's where you get all of your information too. Let's apply these tests um, in looking at um, a simple question about sending spam. So uh, as we know, spam is unwanted bulk email. And spammers claim that they're merely exercising their free speech rights. Furthermore, unless the message is deceptive, spamming is not inherently dishonest. So if you receive an email message that's completely accurate, the problem is not that it's uh, dishonest, but that you're being annoyed. And, and in a sense, you're being harassed. So we can apply those moral tests. Um, uh, for example, uh, the harms test. Uh, the harms are actually quite vast when you look at the millions of people who are affected and the time that they must spend deleting the uh, unwanted email messages or the uh, disk space that uh, these unwanted email messages consume. It also reduces trust in email. We can't always know whether uh, email message that we're receiving is uh, something we would be interested in, and whether it's from somebody we wouldn't uh, know. Uh, so um, we put into um, place all kinds of spam filters, which in fact uh, filter, may filter out legitimate messages. But the point is that spam reduces trust in email as a form of communication. The reversibility test. Well, senders of spam dislike receiving spam themselves. So it really it doesn't make sense for them to impose on other people. Common practice test. If everybody sent spam, then it would completely clog the communications network and we couldn't use the network at all. So it doesn't make sense as a common practice. Finally, uh, we can apply a legality test. Certainly there's a can spam law which applies in the United States, but it does not apply outside the United States where much spam originates. Spammers, even those located physically in the United States, use computers uh, outside the United States to initiate spam. And the can spam law does not apply outside the United States ju jurisdiction. So the key idea in this video is that what's legal and what's ethical are not always the same. Uh, if spam messages originate from outside the United States, in a sense they're legal from United States law because the United States law does not apply. Focusing only on complying with the law can even be dangerous in engineering. When engineers design a new product for which there are no safety standards, uh, they are, are treading on difficult ground here. This happened with uh, the first generation of portable cribs. Uh, the, these new portable cribs in the 1980s complied with all standards in place at the time, and so they were uh, released with minimal testing because, the, there was, because there were no applicable standards at the time. So since there were no standards, there was um, not a, a, an accepted testing regime for those portable cribs, and several babies died when the rails of those cribs collapsed. Um, so. It's important to think about your uh, obligations in, as engineers in solving these moral problems by applying uh, uh, basic moral values, uh, honesty, fairness, uh, and so on, or these tests, such as harms, uh, reversibility, and legality tests, being very aware that even if it's allowed by law and thus legal, it may not be the right thing to do.